Are you tired of wasting time on entertainment that doesn't bring you a sense of community? Do you feel like people are trying to force you to take a side in this silly culture war? Does your media have you feeling too conservative, too woke, too religious, too heathenous, not enough whatever, like a freak? That's because you're not a character. You're a real person. You're messy, and you don't fit into a box. Good news. We're freaks, too. Would you like to melt your stress away? Get connected to a community of other misfits? Maybe listen to the misfits? Stop feeling like a lonely outsider surrounded by people trying to enlist you in a war you want no part of. Become a contented member of a community that requires only that you live your best life and leave others to live theirs. Feel a sense of belonging while opting out of the culture war. This is Peace Freaks. How is everybody doing today? Welcome once again to Peace Freaks. I am Nikki P here as always with my lovely wife and co-host Lizzie. How are we doing today, babe? We are here. This is episode number 92, in case you were wondering, and we have an interesting one as we call from the front lines of ground zero of constitutional overreach, we'll just say. Yeah. Mr. Mr. DeWine just keeps wanting to, man. Yeah, that Ohio. It was first and hardest, and yeah. you know, the rest of the country's been working at catching up to us. Just, uh, just a special feeling knowing that, you know, your state's that state in this situation. Isn't it, though? Mm-hmm. You, you get a warm, fuzzy feeling inside. Some some sort of feeling inside. I don't know if it's really warm or fuzzy, but there's how that. are how are you feeling being essential, Liz? I mean, I, I guess I I feel grateful. And yeah, because having money coming in is 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 useful at this time, I suppose. It is useful at this time. You know, before it's completely devalued and all that happy nonsense. I I technically am. I I believe that I'm supposed to believe that I'm essential. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I believe that for real. Well, I mean, let's let's face it. I don't think any of us are, you know, counting any of our chickens really at this point. Cause, yeah, I'm just waiting until my boss is telling me that, oh, we got to close down. So, you know, you try and make the best decisions you can with what you got uh, available to you and we'll figure it out as it comes. So on the front, lots of new things going on. Uh, so I started this week. I'm going to be doing three days a week, Monday, Wednesday and Friday with this week in Liber Pods. That's a, a fun little change of pace. Oh, yeah. It's like the most difficult show I produce, but I've kind of gotten it into a sweet spot where most of the stuff is done and I just kind of have to record a few little pieces to go into it. Nikki did some streamlining there. Yeah. So I'm going to be helping promote more libertarian podcasts that way, which I like doing, at least while we still can, you know? For sure. In the land of the Constitution being non-existent anymore. There is that. (laughs) It certainly feels that way, doesn't it? It feels some sort of way. You don't want to be on mic saying anything like that. Like when they come and black bag me, you want to be left alone, right? No, I don't really know that that was the aim. I, I'm just, I'm trying to be as as uh, optimistic as I can. Like technically you don't know exactly what's going to happen. So I'm I'm trying to, to hope that, you know, there's, there's a light at the end of this tunnel. But we'll, we'll see. This was a, we recorded this episode actually a couple, was it probably two weeks ago. Sound about right? Uh, something along those lines, maybe, yeah. And it's so weird. We were just joking, you and me today. I'm like, yep, we're two weeks away from the crest, two weeks away from being overwhelmed. And I feel like it's been two weeks away from overwhelm for a month now. Yeah. Well, I mean, enough. that is, I think, one of the uh, the most challenging things about this whole situation. It just feels so like so much limbo. And it's felt like that for weeks. It's supposed so, to. Yeah. They're, they're going to drive people insane. That's the goal. Uh huh. So we had this episode. I'm going to be honest. I don't think there's a whole lot of Liz even in this episode. You were just going to listen to us be weird. No, honestly, you guys, you guys got, got off on your, uh, your track there and you just started rolling, which is, is great. That's why I like, uh, you two guys getting together, getting to talk, um, because you get some really interesting ideas. Interesting ideas for sure. I, uh, I'm going to be like, I I still like Matt. Matt's a good guy, but I feel like he's just kind of painted himself into a corner where he's like waiting for like he he's maybe invested in like a, a a complete he's invested in the new future that he sees coming I guess is what it feels like and I mean I don't know that like I guess it seems almost like he, he welcomes some authoritarianness that I'm I'm not cool about so I'm you know I'm keeping my ears to the ground like I said him and Kevin are still kind of banging the drums that this disease is going to permanently change the landscape of humanity and. I've still yet to see any any indications that that's going to happen from the disease. Definitely the response to the disease is going to. Well, yeah, I feel like whatever the cause, you know, the, the world that it ha- we're coming out into at the end of this is not going to be the world that we, we closed our doors on when we, we all, you know, started self-isolating or whatever you want to call it. So 
I mean, I still go to work three days a week. You're still working every day. Oh, no, I know. And then, I so, mean, like, I, I know we're not really isolated, but I, I like to believe that, you know, it's going to be a world that's worth living in. <sighs> you can always, always have that hope. Well, I, I won't worry you about threatening to kill all of us again. So there's <laughs> that. I mean, I feel like, you know, we're, we're all aware of the, uh, the options, but you know, despair is, uh, is really only a sensible choice if you really know what your, your options are. And we don't. So. You know what I do know is? What do we know? I know that the freaks come out at night. They do. They do. It's and, a good uh, you know, the freaks are still, still being freaky, even if, uh, they're six feet away from all the other freaks at the moment. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I don't know. I've definitely been having some, some difficulty feeling like mustering enough of this. I feel like, what am I, what am I wasting my life on doing anything, you know? Yeah. But, but then again, I'm kind of like, yeah, let's just keep going. Why well, not? I mean, I, uh, we, we talked about it and I couldn't help but feel like, you know, the, the community that we, we have through doing the, the podcast is, is worth, you know, worth holding on to however we need to do that. And, you know, I'm not guaranteeing that we're going to keep doing this forever, but you know, while the, while the getting is good, we might as well get it. You're probably right about that. Way more, uh. I don't know, way more sane than I am, because I certainly do not feel sane these particular days. Well, I mean, I feel like that that dynamic is is not exactly new. We 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 tend to you know temper each other. Like when I'm off on my crazy worrying tangents, you you can be the voice of reason and and vice versa. So we just trade off. I don't even know that I'm worried so much. I just I'm tired. Yeah, <laughs> that's always my life. Like I get suicidal when I'm fucking tired. Yeah, I'm just. I'm tired of dealing with people and the nonsense. So just yeah. let it be over. Can we do mm -hmm. that? Here's a thought. That's just generally how I work, I guess. So we got an interview here with Mr. Matthew Erickson of the Wealth, Power, and Influence with Jason Stapleton program. That's this ought to be fun. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I was, it was a good conversation. Like me and Matt, like we get really, really weird really fast. Yeah, and, but and I think it, it kind of has a hopeful bent. So We both have, uh, let's just say read a lot of really weird existential philosophy yeah. and a lot of weird technology stuff. So, I mean, like I said, there's a lot of information there. I guess my big thing is, is that, so like if I, when I know how, what we talked about in this episode, none of the stuff that I bring up has been rectified yet. Mm -hmm. Like we've got well, the numbers, honestly, if, I, like, if we're paying attention, look better than they did at this point in time. Yeah. We have not been overwhelmed yet, as they said we would be two weeks from then. And yet they still haven't done anything about the core problem that we are not testing people to know what our actual, you know, rate of infection is. We have no fucking clue. And it boggles my mind. So if you didn't gather, we're going to be talking about COVID-19 or the couve, as I like to call it. I like calling it the couve. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a good time. I guess. So I guess without further ado, let's, uh, let's pump up the track and then let's get into this bad boy. All right. fun listening to your your stream the other day actually although i was a little uh i was a little surprised i'd, I'd gotten the impression you actually been following it a lot longer than you had been because i've been following this since january <laughs> mm -hmm. and the thing that I, I and it's why i think everyone's fucking up and i think it's deliberately done they're fucking up the numbers because there's a couple things that if you only started following it two weeks ago that you don't know more than likely which is that the way that they've been keeping numbers has changed three times. And the ways in which they've been keeping numbers has actually forced it to uh, look like that curve is a hell of a lot faster than it is. Mm. I think this has been around a hell of a lot longer than people are saying. I think it has every, too. Everywhere. And I don't think the curve is near as steep as they're making it out to be. Because like the every curve looks like when, when history's done on this, they're going to look at those curves and go, oh my God. The fact of the matter is, is, though, you went from testing nobody, letting it incubate so it's everywhere, and then it, when you do eventually start testing, there's just an explosion of people that have it. Well, there wasn't an explosion of people that had it at all. It just was, we finally started testing on it. And that's actually happened in every single country where this has been a thing. So I think they're the, I'm not saying it's not uh, getting out there fast. I think they're really overshooting how fast that is. But I also think they're doing that on purpose. Like, I think that it was designed to, like, the thing that sold it for me is I saw that, I sent you that article the other day specifically about, um, that I, was it, AIER had posted about the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. 
And it was just like, oh my God. Like they set this whole thing up so they can swoop in and be the fucking heroes. And it's, oh my God. It, like I came across that event 201 thing and it was actually on January 31st that I tweeted about it. I went and ran down, did a long tweet thread running down all the different points. And I was like, this is, this is basically a recipe for the takeover of the global economy. Mm. What? Which is what Davos wants. Their whole point yeah. is to force a global a global world order centered around, you know, the big businesses. I, if, if you do listen to, uh, what's her name at all? Propaganda Report, I think it is. What it is, Liz? Mm-mm. Prop Report, yeah. Yeah, Prop Report with... Uh, Monica Perez. Yeah, Monica Perez. It gets a little more, a little, I won't say Alex Jonesy, because she definitely uses, finds her sources, both her and her producer, Binkley. They've been following it since, I think, actually the end of December. And I, I listen. Okay. I listen every day, and they give all the updates. And it's been crazy because I mean, everything like everything that they were saying when they read that event two hundred one stuff from back then. It, it's it's literally word for word some of that shit's come out of the mouths of the news media, and they're all pretending it didn't happen because all those people that are in like the news and stuff, their whole situation was like you think like oh well we did a we did a test for this back in November like you know how this would all work you know this is what we found and and they're not saying that they're just going and reading the scripts that they all ran over in that and it's it's fucking freaky deaky especially when we we see how fast and how hard this has all come upon us. Now, you, you could say, well, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation got a lot of money and good scientists, so obviously they prepared for this. I'm like, okay, that makes sense, but why are we why why are we not talking to other people that have other opinions on it? So I'm 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 trying to be as hopeful as I can because like you 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 you've been the person I we actually talked about you and Kevin Geary. You've been the two canaries I've been listening to the most. Kevin's a little alarmist in my opinion because he's not giving yet. He's just saying everyone's he basically just saying everyone should be freaking out about this. I don't know <laughs> that everyone should be freaking out about it. They should just be using caution. That's that's what mm-hmm. my thing is. Like we should all be using caution to try and I guess just not be stupid. I guess maybe not being stupid is asking too much of people. <laughs> yeah, I mean there's nothing to be gained by freaking out. Like freaking out doesn't doesn't uh it doesn't make the virus spread slower. It doesn't like it, it compromises your own immune system. Yeah. Um, and if, I mean, if this is, there's, I, I, I've, I think two things are true at the same time. And I've said this on a number of different points lately, but I think two things are true at the same time. One, this is a virus that is a, a sincere pandemic threat that can kill a lot of people. And two, there's some sketchy shit going on with powerful people orchestrating these events and trying to use it as uh, use it opportunistically as a way to to centralize power, or take over power in various industries. I don't think those things are mutually exclusive. Me neither. And and like I I, I don't know how much I necessarily believe that this is a, like a global threat. But either way, whether or not it is, we're st- still in the aftermath of where they've convinced the whole world it is. And that that's really what what frustrates me now. You've you've kind of taken some turns in the past uh, past year, definitely. I mean, we uh, if people who don't know, we had Matt on probably about a year ago now. I feel like that's not about mm-hmm. right. And um, you know, I guess I would have assumed you would call it, consider yourself probably, if not an ANCAP, pretty close to it. And you have kind of shifted some of your viewpoints, probably more towards where Jason is. I think you're actually kind of more towards me than you were in a sense that I've kind of always looked at anarchism as being the end point. Like, it's something we should strive towards. Like, it is a failure of human beings that we're not that. And eventually we will grow, our evolution will lead us away from religions, will lead us away from governments to just being free people. But, you know, evolutionarily, I understand why we have all that here. You know, because people <laughs> just look at how freaked out everybody is right now. Like, no one's thinking. Everyone's just reacting to everything. And it's it's frustrating. I'm cur- curious, like, what's kind of, has this been, like, the, the peak of that for you? Or has this been just something that's been part of that evolution? It's been part of that evolution, but it's kind of crystallized a bunch of the stuff that I was I was thinking before. I'm, all along, I've... I've been moving in this direction and I don't see it as moving away from anarchism. Like I think you framed it really well that, that anarchism is kind of like the end point. Um, what I've, the phrase I've been using lately is that libertarianism is, is an end. It's not a means. And this was something that I started realizing as I, I can't remember exactly what started me down the pathway, but something that really helped was the book, The Machiavellians by James Burnham. And it talked about the Machiavellian look at the, at the world. And, and Machiavellianism has a bit of a, of a negative connotation because it typically is, you think of someone who's Machiavellian as someone who's very, who's kind of like an evil schemer, mm. but, but really the, the, um, the actual meaning of it is someone who deals with the world as it is rather than dealing in, like in the world of politics, what we do is we take what's actually happening and then we abstract out an ideal 
And then we try to relate to that ideal rather than relating with the actual facts on the ground. Yeah. Um, so what I've been finding is that like people, you'll say, well, um, let me think of a, try and think of an example here. If you might try to, uh, like you want to get a certain policy um, across. So maybe you want to have, like just in general, if you want the state to be minimized, the best way to go about that isn't going to be attacking the state. Because if you attack the state head on, maybe your your intent is for the state to be minimized. But when you attack it head on, you incentivize the state to attack you back and you incentivize more authoritarianism. So if your goal is less authoritarianism, you actually don't want to attack the state directly because you'll you'll create. So it's it's thinking about what our individual actions, what the actual consequences that they will have. Mm-hmm. And so from there, I've been realizing that um, also that human beings don't the, the, the famous saying was that um, uh, I can't remember who said it, but he said that, that um, humans want security. They don't want liberty and the majority of people. Well, what's what's funny is because I actually listened to uh, it was the most recent Tom Woods episode and he said something and you actually kind of were hinting at it. I felt like in your, your live stream the other day that I've been saying for a long time. And it's the fact that government is a market good. Yes, it's because people are fucking lazy and they don't want to have to think about shit. So they would rather offload that off to somebody else. And that is a it's a hard thing for, you know, people like me to deal with because fuck those people. I don't think they should have the right to fucking enact violence on me because they're fucking lazy asses. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. So it's, I understand that for me, that is the reality I live in that like, I have so many friends that think that this is going to usher in some new world and that it's going to wake up the masses. And I'm like, the masses are terrified. All they want is a strong man to come in and protect them. And exactly that sucks for us. But it doesn't do us any good to ignore that fact. Like I have so many, so many, you know, my anarchist friends that are just like, "We all, why are, how why are you all laying down and taking this?" And mostly it's because I don't want to fucking get shot. <laughs> like, exactly. Like, like when they start rolling through with the fucking tanks, I don't want to be on the on the watch list. Like that's stupid. I, I, it occurred to me recently that the whole "give me liberty or give me death" thing is kind of I I'm seeing that in a bit of a different light than I used to. Well, yeah. for me. I, it, it changed I had a kid. Like, I, I don't have yeah. the luxury of just being able to fucking go and live to principle. If you can live to principle like that, God, that's a good life for you, and I admire your fortitude, but my kid's not going to fucking eat without me, so I've got to do my best to make sure that she can survive this. Like, <laughs> everyone, this whole boogaloo thing that's been going on, I'm like, I, I, great if you want to fight a war. I'm not in a position to, unfortunately, and, you know, you can call me a coward or whatever. I don't fucking care, but, you know, the minute I had her, like life changed in that regard. Yeah, I completely understand that. I, I, I don't think I don't see the I don't see the value in in launching myself against the state apparatus and getting myself squished like a bug on a windshield just for some for some higher purpose. Well, and even if you did, it's like I think that some people envision that there's just all the masses are gonna see see your martyrdom and you know follow along and. Unfortunately, like for me, I I can still would consider myself an anarchist in that I want to spread the word and you know let people know there's a better fucking way. We don't have to buy this shit. They may not be ready for it, and maybe someday they will. But you can't take on the machine unless you have an army, and you need to build that army. Yes, I bring it up all the time. There's a there was a number one on the radio back in the '80s that would never ever air today called uh, Silent Running. <laughs> and what's hilarious about the song is that, you know, I, I laugh because there's actually a lyric in the song where it's, there's a gun and ammunition just inside the doorway used in an emergency. And I'm trying to imagine any song ever making it to a top 10 with that in it. Not a chance now. Um, but there's a lyrics, don't believe the church and state in anything they tell you. I teach the children quietly because someday sons and daughters will rise where we stood still. Like there's a whole lot of super <laughs> subversive messages of the song that wow. was a fucking hit on the radio. And it blows what was my the song m- called again? Silent Running. By Mike and the Mechanics, believe it or not. Huh. <laughs> and I'm going to have to go listen to that. I guarantee, I guarantee you've actually probably heard it because it was a big hit in the 80s. And it's just, this was on the radio. And you never think about the lyrics based on like how the song is. It was even tied into a bit of a movie. I think the song actually is really, like it's a father telling talking to his son from like hanging out with God or something is the idea. And he's just kind of telling him, don't believe all the worldly shit because it's bullshit. Just do what you can to take care of your family and yourself and the people around you. And there's something better that's waiting for Mm. you. But man, (laughs) those lyrics hit fucking hard. No kidding. So another thing that you've been doing, which 
I like that a lot of people aren't doing is thinking of the positives that are going on right now, especially when it comes to the technological front. I, I think you got a little maybe it too into the weeds when you were coming up with different ways we're going to open doors. I felt like that was, eh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but I get, I get where you're coming from. But I do see a lot of struct like this forcing a lot of structural changes that I don't necessarily see going back. Even if everything lasted two weeks and went back to quote unquote normal, I think if you're pushing all these companies to work, go to more of a work from home method, I think the reason they haven't done it is because of the necessary infrastructure changes that are going to happen, that they wouldn't have wanted to pony up the dough to happen. But if they've already done that because they were forced to, I don't see them giving that all up just to go back to the old method. Like, mm. Absolutely. There'd be no reason to. It's, it's, there's no reason for them to do something that's, that's less efficient. Yeah. yeah. You know, and as an environmentalist myself, I absolutely love the idea of like, yeah, more people working from home. Let's, uh, let's have a whole hell of a lot less driving. Let's, uh, let's empty those LA freeways as far as I'm concerned. Then we don't need to care yeah. what oil prices are. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. If you can, it, like ev everywhere where there's been a big quarantine, shutdown, lockdown, whatever you want to call it, there's been a profound impact on on the environment. There's mm. the the canals in Venice are are clearing up, and you can see fish swimming in them, and they've got swans back on top of them. And then you can actually look at satellite footage of the the air pollution clearing up over these different cities and stuff. So really, what it is is just a matter of figuring out how to maintain um, stable employment with with a with a growing economy and retaining the same amount of of relative distancing and i think the the idea of having a potentially perpetually mutating fairly highly infectious virus that is out and around all the time and we have to build our society around it i think that that's going to force the hand of people to to start acting in ways that's going to be promoting better stuff for the environment. And see, that's where I think you I think you go a little bit further than I, I would just because, just to be clear, that is the natural state of the world and always has been. I think that part is where people are actually going a little overboard with this and that I haven't seen the numbers yet to suggest that we're going to have it. Like every virus mutates a lot. You, most mutations just go away because they'll just die off. They don't I guess especially once you know something exists. Because honestly, there are plenty of things that we can do that can make this not a problem, like in the long run. Like you said, even if it was something simple, like, yeah, you can just stop opening fucking doors. I'm in a, <laughs> I'm in a bit, like, why do we not have automatic doors and everything at this point? That's a good question. I'm glad I was paying attention a little bit before everyone else was on this because like, I work with uh, ATMs and jukebox, touchscreen jukeboxes for a living. <laughs> Oh, and, and so, so this would be a big market disruptor for you. Yeah. Well, well aside from that, I'm a musician. Uh, all that income went away. And right now mm -hmm. they're skeleton crew for the other day job for me. The only one of us that's doing good is Miss UPS over here. You got to ship <laughs> stuff still. Thank working God. For those yeah, fucking no teams, working for those teams. Like I said, if anything happens to her job, uh, I'm going to be honest. I think we've got bigger problems than us eating. I think we have like systemic issues <laughs> that are going to topple yeah. double the global economy worse than even I'm thinking it's going to do it. Because that, I mean, if if she stops, that means the supply lines have ended, and we're kind of yeah. That's where that's where shit hits the fan in a hurry. Yeah, and I don't, I don't, I really, I'm just not like I said on my stream the other day that I'm um I'm perpetually optimistic about about the human spirit, about human ingenuity. And um, Naval Ravikant, one of my, I talk about him all the time, one of my favorite follows on Twitter, he tweeted yesterday that for the first time in human history, the entire world is all focused on the same problem. And if the entire world is all focused on the same problem right now, I feel very confident that the entire world is going to be able to come up with solutions to stay ahead of whatever problems are coming. Mm. And see, you, when you, like, you're kind of like a, a, a reverse mirror image of how I feel about it. Like, I am endlessly <laughs> pessimistic about humanity's like spirit. I'm... I am, however, per like perpetually optimistic about smart people. Smart people do great shit all the fucking time. I, I believe that smart people will continue doing great shit. I look at like 
the the mass of everybody's eyes on everything being more like the eye of Sauron. I'm like, no, get that shit away from, from there. <laughs> Please go back to paying attention to other shit and let the people that know more than you fucking do more than you. Uh-huh. And that's that's the biggest thing that's been crazy in all this is just the fucking uh, the misinformation and like. <sighs> Like, I wish everyone would take the lesson that the government fucked this up so bad that we need to decentralize everything. Unfortunately, I think the way that decentralization is going to look is going to be big NGOs taking over in the places of government, which will are their own governments in themselves. There's nothing more terrifying to me than the UN and the World Health Organization because they routinely put out shit that is just, frankly, in my opinion, evil. Like, their their views of how they want the world to function are fucking terrifying because it always works out to be just a global socialist order. I don't know if you've you, if you followed any of the uh, the like environmental issues, like well, the way they uh, what is that that um, paper they put out the IPAA or whatever it is, Liz? Yeah. Uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or whatever. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the name of it. But yeah, <laughs> we reread the whole thing. I mean, there's a you did a pre market screen earth where yeah. you talked about it. I remember. It's fucking terrifying, Matt. Like the things that they want to see happen, like. Uh, you and Jason, I think, did an episode on it the one day, and it was just, oh my god! I mean, it, how do you, how do you see past that stuff when you're trying to like pick the information that you're into? Part of it has to do with just not being able to to kind of hold myself back and not try to take on all the world's problems all at the same time because my psyche won't be able to handle it. And then also just seeing if you if you zoom out far enough, I, people push back on me when I say this, but I keep saying if you zoom out far enough, if you look at the trend of of he, the human race throughout the course of of six thousand years or whatever of modern civilization, mm-hmm. the what I see is increasingly imp, uh, is the increasing empowerment of the individual. So even now, even with as expansive as governments and stuff are now, on an individual human level, we're able to live. In a in a way that's the, our standard of living is much higher than than other humans have in the past. It's mm-hmm. we're increasingly because because of the development of technology. So technology and government are kind of separate separate trends. Government power now. Government is a technology. Government is a tool. And this is like you said before. The reason that we have the government that we have now is because of market demand for it. Market demand for the a, a tool that provides the types of solutions that people think that they want to have. And it's popular enough that we just keep getting it. And so as long as there isn't a superior technology available for people to to opt for, that's going to continue being the case. But the way that human societies have always functioned, this is one of the realizations I came to reading that book, The Machiavellians, is that every human society has elites. And every human society is run by the elites. And this is the natural way of, of human organization. It doesn't matter what, what um, arrangement it is. You're always going to have the select um, that are either more powerful, more intelligent, more, uh, I mean, more physically powerful, more intelligent, more wealthy, anything like that. Somehow um, you have the, the, the Pareto principle, the 90-10 rule or the 80-20 mm-hmm. rule or whatever you want to call it. And that exists fractally. So you have 90% of people have 10% of the wealth, while well, 10% of the people have 90% of the wealth. But then if you take that that 10% that has 90% of the wealth, that same phenomenon exists there where 90% of them have 10% of that wealth and 10% of them have 90% of that wealth. And it keeps going all the way up to the top. Hmm. So every human, what? I always joke about, I joke with my bosses about, you're like, yeah, you guys got money to me. But then like the people with real money just look at you like, look at these poor pieces of shit. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like it doesn't matter how rich you are. There's always someone that that couldn't live being as poor as you are. Yeah. Right? So this is how this is how every human human society has always arranged itself. There's always going to be the select elites at the top who are the ones who are really running the show. They're the ones who are controlling what's happening, and their primary goal is is um, insulating themselves from competition mm-hmm. and ensuring that. The, that they aren't overthrown by the masses. And so this is why democracy was such a brilliant invention because it gives the masses the impression that they are actually controlling the show when they aren't because yeah. of things like forced choice and stuff like that. So there's there's a degree to which um, when people talk about, this is my, my problem with libertarian um, with libertarianism as a political philosophy is that people talk about how, oh, we just need to spread the word to other people and pretty soon they'll just vote the way we want them to or something, some kind of a name thing like that. Well, they and would. that's not the way that social change happens. They would, but you need to have, you know, more than the 10,000 hours that the system forces them through anyways. 
Yeah, yeah. And it <laughs> yeah, just, you can so, do that. So, so the, the masses can, can um, cause massive change when they become disgruntled and they become un, they uncontrollable, when you start getting rioting, that type of thing. That's where the masses can influence things. Mm-hmm. But in general, with the normal functioning of the system, the masses have very little control over it. So right now, if you wanted to get your message out, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to, if you wanted to enact social change from a libertarian perspective, would you, I'll, I'll put this to you, which would you rather do? Would you rather try to persuade 30 million people to all vote libertarian? Or would you rather get 10 high profile, popular entertainers and um, influential business people and have them all start advocating those ideas? I mean, we know how that works. So, yeah, I it's going to be the, it's going to be the most influential people. Sure. Yeah. So, so this is the, so the way that, that, that human sociological change happens is all of the elites change their minds and go in a certain direction. And then all of the masses just follow them. Now, now I'll pose a question to you. Honestly, this would be probably more of a question to hear what Jason would say, but so in marketing, they talk a lot about tribe and, you know, find your tribe. Do you think that, let's put it this way. We are never going to get uh, libertarian ideas put out by the masses uh, wrote out by the people that would influence the masses because there's no incentive for them to do that because the entire idea uproots the system that they they want exactly. So do you think it's like a better idea? Like this is where I always I, I always like what Jason puts out, and I have a lot of friends that get pissed off at <laughs> Jason for various reasons. But I like the idea. The fact is, you need to go out and become the people that are going to become the influencers. If you have to want to change things, you're going to have to become the millionaire, or the billionaire that you know decides how this all works. So is it just going to be generations of subversive people perhaps not letting their true ideas be known so that they can <laughs> subvert the system at some later date perhaps like that seems like the most likely way to actually and make change if you look at like say the way the new system was was usurped the like uh, was put in the place the way it is now after the last big uprising it was put there by people kind of working underneath the scenes you know it was people that took over the school systems it was people that little by little encroached and you have to play the long game uh, and there's a degree to which i think like the podcasting market like for libertarians has been doing that i do have my concerns that we're seeing a lot of the changes that were put in place with this right now have changed that a bit i i think that they are going to come for us very quickly um and under the guises of false information <laughs> So yep. I, 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 I'm curious to see how we're all going to work past that when you don't have anarchist Twitter and <laughs> anarchist Facebook anymore. What do you think is like the, something that we can look forward to or ways that we can kind of get around it and still maintain our what little community we have? I've been saying for a little while now that I think that the future of the liberty movement is not in politics, that it is in education, business, and entertainment. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it's very useful to think of overreaching totalitarian government as just a an obsolete technology that's malfunctioning Mm -hmm. and so it's going to be it needs to be replaced by a superior technology and as i watch as i take this this kind of thirty thousand foot view of history and i look i see this ever increasing evolution of technology that empowers individual people more and more now at the same time you have you have these these kind of um, countervailing forces where you have technology that's decentralizing things. In other words, it's it's spreading spread loading power out among more and more people. At the same time, you have government as a centralizing force. So the government is trying to pull more and more power into itself. So this means when you put these two together, it means government is trying to take over the technology. Mm-hmm. So the government is a technology that's trying to take over all other technology. Thing is, the nature of technology is that it will continue routing around interference in its pathway. So th- that's where I see I see the the future being in being able to use technologies that replace government services to the point where really what you're wanting is you're wanting the government to show its face. You want you want them to to drop the veneer of this is all in the in the interest of human rights and have them reveal themselves to just be craven power brokers who are trying to um they're trying to hold back and suppress people because at the moment that that becomes evident is when you get when that's when the masses come alive and they 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 kind of turn their brains back on and they stop acting like lemmings to the extent that they become lemmings after someone else. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're in the position to lead the lemmings when they decide that they don't want to follow the existing yeah. system. Because I mean, 
I don't know how any more blatantly that, you know, the 2016 election could have shown the fucking mask off for the government as it is. Like, I don't, like, and it just seems like it made people want to fight, fight more and more for whatever. While you were talking, though, have you looked into Donnie Gaber at all? Gaber, or however you pronounce his name. I like call him Gaber. I like it. It's silent. No, I've never heard of him. The, was it the null hypothesis or whatever? Basically, he has, he has an idea basically to replace government with software. <laughs> And it's hmm. kind of like blockchain every part of the government. And basically your token is your vote in everything. And so if you don't like it, 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 you don't have a say in like land law, if you don't own land kind of shit, and it doesn't matter to you because you don't have land. Hmm. It's a very interesting idea he has. You should look into it. I, I He's a, a former service guy. I think he was in like the army and the Navy and intelligence. And he kind of, he, he looks at the whole process like with government is, being like, you know, these are the issues I see when we're trying to make something work within a population. He 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 was like likening it to when he the, we would go into a place in like Iraq or you know one of those places, and we have to try and get the population to believe a certain thing. And he so he was att- attacking problems from a very different uh, mindset than let's say you or I would have, because he looks at everything as being very problem oriented. But um, Mance Raider always has him on the show. He he gets a little nutty sometimes too. I love I love the freaks, man. That's why I like mm-hmm. our new our new podcast name, Peace Freaks, because I'm all about the peace and I like freaky people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just like people that fucking they're outside the they they look outside the box. It's so it's so hard to find anymore. Um, what do you think the what do you see as being the the worst thing that we're going to come across here? with what we're going through as of right now obviously this is all new and changing by the day for everybody but what do you see the the big bad takeaways that we're going to come up to first that's a good question i think i I, i'm still of the mind that i think that the virus is is definitely Mm -hmm. a a significant threat i'm open to being to having my mind changed on that but um as far as i can tell right now i'm still i'm still pretty persuaded that that's that that's one of the most threatening things i think beyond that um it's going to be something along the lines of like mass unrest because mm-hmm. the the best the best recipe for human thriving is stability you want you you want stability and predictability and because just from even on a on a collective unconscious psychological level if everyone is massively stressed out it's going to take its toll on the on the collective human immune system just the way that stress takes its toll on your own individual immune system Cialdini had a lot of good stuff on that too by the way <laughs> yeah yeah so that's why I think that's probably the thing that I'm most concerned about and this is this is kind of this isn't something I would have said a couple of years ago this is something that I've been starting to understand more and more as I've understood the better the way that the the human race acts as a singular entity because humans this is something i got from nasim taleb he talked about um the idea of localism and that different groups that groups of people are their own entities and that as you scale groups of people up they behave differently and you can evaluate them as an individual enti- entity so a group of 10 people will behave as a different entity than a group of a thousand people and when you once you start evaluating the way that human beings act and everything, you start realizing how important it is to have um, stability. And so, and really what ultimately brings stability is strong leadership because of the way that people um, naturally just instinctively want to delegate away authority. Mm -hmm. So really the, I I think about it this way. This is, um, Hey, it means the world to Liz and I that you spend the time listening to us and I'd hate to lose you to another podcast, but I simply have to tell you about my buddy Sean's podcast, the porcupine perspective. If you like your Liberty raw and unfiltered with just a hint of deep melancholic brooding, then the porcupine perspective is the podcast for you. They ponder big themes and real questions. This is hands down. One of my favorite podcasts. So go subscribe to the Porcupine Perspective so it can be your second favorite. How's it going? This is Nikki P, and I wanted to thank you for stopping by our neck of the woods. I sure hope you enjoy listening to Peace Freaks as much as we enjoy making it. Now, as much fun as it is right now, I know it can be a lot more fun, and the way to make it more fun is to grow that community. Unfortunately for us, growing anything organically on the internet is a thing of the past, and as much as I'd like to dump Irma's college fund into growing the show, that would make me a bad parent. 
So if you want to help create a bigger, more badass community, stop by UpgradeTheShow.com. We have monthly and yearly fiat options and one-time and yearly crypto options. But don't go thinking an upgraded community is all you're going to get. All patrons of the show get access to the Freedom Choir, chock full of bonus shows and our Zoom link to watch our interviews live. So head over to UpgradeTheShow.com and help us upgrade this freaky little community. Doesn't that make you sad? God, it makes me sad. I don't know. It's it, I. I don't know if it may. It's just. It's just how humans are. It's just. It's just what they are. Like it doesn't. It doesn't make me sad that cats sleep all day. You know, just right. because that's just how cats are. The nature of the. Well, thing. that makes me happy. I like cats sleeping. Yeah. It's adorable. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, the the way that I th- I would think about this is that really our concern when we say we don't want totalitarian government, we aren't saying necessarily that we don't want a government with the ability to be totalitarian. What we're saying is that we don't want a government that is abusing its ability to be totalitarian. Because if a government has the potential to be totalitarian, but they don't use it, then it might be uncomfortable. It might make you uneasy, but it's not a threat to you necessarily. It's They're not actually causing harm. Oh, you're getting dangerously close to hopping ideas there, man. Yeah. <laughs> I, and maybe that's, where, maybe that's where I'm headed. But the... Given the way, given that it's inevitable that humans are naturally going to just follow a leader, then then trying to get rid of leaders is never going to be successful by definition. You're never going to do that unless you're able to do it in some way through technology where you you are able. It's I, I imagine if you kind of like you create this system of interlinking blocks that are all like leaned up against each other to where to the point where you can put the last one in place and none and they'll all hold each other up. You don't have to, you know, I, I don't know if this makes sense. I'm trying to like a irreducibly complex system that every part requires the other part to all be in its place to function. Hmm. And this is the idea I think behind Bitcoin was to create a system that didn't need a leader that would manage itself just by the nature of the incentives involved. Well, see, and and that's where I like the idea. I like the word leader because I think the leader is the appropriate word. Like you have Jordan Peterson who's out there leading people across the, you know, country across the world at this point. It's when you give that leader the ability to use force that's the frustrating element to me because I, I look I have no problem with people that have good ideas taking control of it the problem is it's that the people with good ideas tend not to tend to be forced out by people that still use force and ever like, I've seen a lot of people complaining about the degree to which like well we have a, a how how badly government fucked this up? And I was like, well, no, libertarians, like an anarchist society couldn't deal with this. And I'm like, I think 100%, I still believe an anarchist society would fucking deal with this way better than was ever dealt with this because every step of the way, this was fucked up by government and made worse by government. Personally, if you want to go out to a bar and die, that's perfectly okay with me. I will be at home where I will have been since day one. The only time I'm leaving is to go to work, at which point I'm wiping every fucking thing I touch down with Clorox. And when your land's done, someone who's smarter will homestead it, and that's fine by me. <laughs> so to me, every every step of this problem has been created government. I think that was actually on purpose because they want to force the necessity of a strongman leader from the populace, which will always be Bill Gates because for some fucking reason people look up to the guy who's the son of eugenicist. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I personally, I find Bill Gates to be enormously creepy. I don't think that he's he's remotely trustworthy or anything. I think he's got, I think he's got a, like a Messiah complex and like an angel of death thing kind of going on. Well, and that's, and that's where like when you say, we talk about Machiavellians, I don't necessarily think that people are nefarious. Like, I I don't think that that's like, I think that Bill Gates believes he's going to save the world. I do too. I, I think a lot of people have thought that. I think Hitler thought that too. Hitler thought he was going to make the world better for the people that needed it made better for them and get rid of all those others. And that's bullshit. So it's a very... It's difficult because like, I, I see the, the place for leadership and I see that that needs to be there. I, I feel as though the people that would get give that leadership don't ever get their say because it's easier to swing a fucking axe, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. This, but this, yeah, this is what I'm kind of trying to drive at is that, is that um, there isn't a way of eliminating that role of leadership. Of, yeah. Or you, oh, you no, not at call. all governor or president or king or whatever it is there's always going to be that type of person and and i think that the i think that the anarchist observation that those types of arrangements um, create an incentive structure 
that leads to bad consequences. I think that that's a good observation, but I think, I don't think that's the whole story. I think that's like Mm -hmm. the first step in the process. Mm -hmm. And rather than saying leaders can do bad things, therefore we need no leaders. I think the, I think it needs to be something like leaders can do bad things. Therefore we need to create the incentives whereby leaders do good things. And that's, that's, that is no longer a moral problem. That's now an engineering problem. How do we engineer a system whereby mm. people are incentivized to lead in a way where they, where the, the, the best possible incentives that they get from their circumstance comes from them behaving in the best possible way? So you create some sort of a feedback loop where people are incentivized to lead because they get something good from it. And the way that they get the most good things from it is by being the best possible leader. Okay. I mean, to me, that just sounds like the difference between like a, the quote unquote left libertarians and right libertarians is that left libertarians would not believe in hierarchy. And I, I mean, it gets into Michael Malice. I mean, do you believe there are some people that are better than others? And so like, how you answer that question defines your left versus right. Yeah, there's going to be a hierarchy. There are going to be smarter people. There's going to be more industrious people that are going to be better at telling other people how to fucking live. Like it just is, which is kind of the premise behind like Hop's work where there is a, a formula for what will be a better society depending on what you want society to be, I guess. Um, and perhaps, look like in the Hoppian sense, they would defa- def- describe that as a society that's more likely to thrive and live longer. I'm, I'm not personally here to say what the best society is. I just want people to not be telling me what my society should be. And that's the frustrating part is because I like the idea of tribes. I like the idea of people getting to live their lives the way they want. But there's this natural compulsion, it feels like, for human beings to want to have this everyone on the same page. And I don't know that that's possible. And at every turn that they try to do that, it seems like it makes shit way fucking worse for like the actual human being. Well, like you said that that you think that a lot of people like Bill Gates, for example, that these maybe they don't have bad intentions necessarily, like they think mm-hmm. they're saving the world. I think the way that they view this is that if there are people that are if everybody isn't on the same page, then that's um, like that's the recipe for war kind of because yeah. if people aren't on the same page then they fight. Well, the thing is, the recipe for war is trying to get everybody on the same page. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, I, from the it's it's never more clear than it, like if you you follow like the environmentalist circles because like we were talking in our, our last episode, Liz. What was it that that woman had said? Like it was basically human beings are a virus and that needs to be wiped from the planet. Was the idea behind it? And there are a lot yeah. of people within the environmental circle that just want all human beings dead. Like that is their goal is to wipe us off the planet. And and they think they're doing the right thing. They think they're in the right. They're the good people. That's why I love that question. I can't remember. Who is it that always poses it? Have you ever stopped to consider you're the bad guys? Yes. Malice <laughs> is the one who says that. Yeah. And, and yeah. I, I, I love that because I think so many people, like, I think every, I, I don't know that evil necessarily truly exists. I think there's just a lot of people that think they're doing the right thing and have the math wrong. Mm. So, yes, this is, this is getting into some, some, uh, this is the, uh, this is the type of stuff that I've thought, I've thought about on psychedelics <laughs> that, that perhaps there is um I don't no even need the drugs, as, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's what that's what got me first thinking about it. Now I don't anymore. Mm-hmm. That um that the perhaps there is no such thing as evil. There's just people who are when when everybody is is seeking their own self is pursuing their own self interest. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that's your self interest uh correlates with the the self interest of other people. And sometimes they clash. And Mm -hmm. so then perhaps evil is when you are saying that your self-interest should take precedent over someone else's Mm self-interest. Yeah, I don't know. I I, I was looking for a... I was looking for a, a thing here that I'd sent my dad the other day talking about Bill Gates as we were talking about him. And I said, he strikes me as the type who would be all starry eyed as he sealed the doors of the furnaces, listening to the screams of the dying, thinking to himself with a soft smile. If only they knew how beautiful it was that they get to sacrifice themselves to bring about a better world. I mean, yeah, that's, that's how uh, that's how Bill Gates comes across to me. Um, that's basically kind of how I feel about Bill Gates. I, I I just I, I and there's so many people like that's the problem like I do, do I really think that what the hell was that asshole that was just running for president that fucking banned sodas in his state he I'm sure believes he was doing the right thing for New York State you know by banning sodas and making it harder for poor people and to have the choices fulfilled that they want to because it was going to make their lives better mm-hmm. they don't they don't know it but it's going to be better for them what was that guy's name Liz was it De Blasio. I don't know. See the guy that just just ran for president. Uh, he did. He's the the oh, mayor of, or mayor of New York. 
Hmm. New York City. And he's, he's the one that... I'm not good on the names of the guys who dropped yeah, out. Yeah, I don't care that much. I've really, really gotten out of the interest of politics over the past year. <laughs> I'm way more interested in the philosophy. Yeah, same here. Same here. When you talk about the people who are like the, the environmentalists who think that the human beings are a virus and that they need to be wiped out. my Maybe a, a year or so ago, I would have thought, okay, so what we need to do is we need to keep them, we need to restrain them somehow. We need to keep them mm. from, from doing whatever that they're going to do. Now, I think of it differently. I don't think I need to stop them from doing whatever they're going to do. I just think I need to stop them from doing whatever they're going to do to me. Mm. And then other people are responsible for the same thing. And then if we're all, if we're all on the same page that we all are like, okay, we disagree with those people and we don't want them to do something to us, then we can consolidate our efforts and say, okay, all of our tribe here, all of the people that are associated with us, we all disagree with that. And we want to protect and insulate ourselves from that. But we don't need to necessarily stop them. We just need to stop them from doing something to us. If you never watched the movie 12 Monkeys, have you? I haven't. Go watch that movie and you tell me again that we don't need to worry about those people. Because the entire premise of 12 Monkeys is what we're living today brought about by one of those people. They, the whole premise of the movie is a virus that wipes out all of humanity and forces what can survive underground was released by a fucking by a hippie that wanted to make the world better for the animals and just wipe out humanity. So... <laughs> Well, so again, so I'm, I'm not saying that we that that they need to just be allowed yeah. to run amok. I'm saying that that um, if we approach the problem differently and we approach yeah. the problem as a matter of self defense rather than a matter of because because then so from them they're like, well, we need to. I see people. I see, and it's not just people. They say I see other people mm -hmm. as the reasons are as the greatest threat to the world or greatest threat to humanity. So I need to go attack those people and prevent them from from harming everyone, everybody. Yeah. Well, that's our same perspective towards them. We're like, well, we need to go attack them and prevent them from harming people. Yeah. So now, so now it's just a matter of perspective. Whose perspective is right? And that's entirely subjective. Hmm. My, my concern is that there's a lot of those people with PhDs in universities right now cranking out other people that believe like they do. Oh, it's totally true. <laughs> it's fucking terrifying. Like, I can't tell you how many PhDs you'll see on Twitter that, like, will have those tweets. And you're just like, what do I got defense? Like, we can't even get anyone with any type of, you know, sane mindset into a university because the minute they see that you're not on board with the agenda, you're pff, out the door. That's a greatest, the greatest thing that could possibly happen is the destruction of the universities. <laughs> press and the universities. The press is well on its way. The universities need to be next. I Well, and they've kind of both destroyed themselves in some ways. The thing is, while we're going through this whole shakeup, is the system going to allow what should happen to happen? Or is this its kind of way of fighting that, uh, which is what I'm concerned about? Like, I, I see that technology should absolutely lead to a decentralization. Like, more people should be going and getting out of school and whatnot. But what I'd like to see are 10,000 people educating people in the way that people want to be educated what i see is people being mandated to learn the way that the government wants you, instead of having more teachers you're going to have the one the one person out of dc that teaches every class for every person that's you know in every grade that kind of thing that's what's the real frightening thing about me and so something that has worked marginally well is going to be thrown into overgear like thrown into overdrive to to be even more homogenized it's possible I, and again i just i i see i see every generation having these same thoughts every generation mm -hmm. feels this way every generation sees um impending doom right around the corner and they see oh this is an unprecedented um taking of power by the institutions. And yet somehow it just keeps going. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't see, it's very, very difficult to manage lots of people. And yeah. right now the man behind the curtain is having to work overtime, trying to, to keep up appearances. And I just don't see that being feasible for a long period of time, especially as, as people are able to begin solving these problems on their own. I mean, what we're seeing through this whole thing is deregulation in the healthcare industry. Hmm. And God, if only it stays. God, I hope it stays. I, well, and, 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 I know, and I think that this seems like a perfect, if this was the scenario that they, if this scenario was created deliberately for the sake of, 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 of centralizing stuff, then I don't know if they planned it out very well because already the narrative is there that the way to solve this problem is going going to be by deregulation, like allowing doctors to practice across, straight, uh, across state lines and freeing up um, private institutions to be able to do um, to develop new drugs and do studies like that because of all of the red tape in the, F in the FDA and the CDC. And it's been surprising to me how much people have, have gotten ahead on that narrative before the media could control it. And they've been highlighting the fact that the FDA choke points are what has created a delay in testing.
and this is where that event 201 thing comes in because i don't think it ever was to move to government i think they've realized the government's lack in what they can do and the idea is to force people to private entities you know just the ones that happen to know this was going to happen and manage to weather the crash of the economy and buy out when the buying was good months ago well and then i would say that's a good thing because because really the, the governments aren't the ones that hold the power the government is just a front for the people that hold the power Absolutely. and so now what you're seeing is the front is being dropped well that's what you and me see and this this and this is always what the issue is because yeah we're we're fucking woke we see what's going on does does Susie up the street see that or does Susie up the street see oh my god Bill Gates has saved the world we need to do whatever Bill Gates says because that's like you said they're looking for that leader and that's that's the guy who's going to step in when everything's said and done you know I, what, what, how, no matter what comes and this is I think while I like it's fun to talk about this stuff and, and, and pose about it the ultimate thing is we're going to have to deal with whatever world comes down the pipe and I got to do best fighting whatever that world is or being yep. a part of it so <laughs> you know it's kind of a doesn't fucking matter I guess but it, it, it there's a maybe like an inner sadness I have to see the fact that it's like to me it's almost like humanity's so close and just keeps fucking the football up on the last like on the 10 yard line it's like <laughs> really people like you could be right there but you're you, you still want to fucking play caveman and it's frustrating I think the best thing that we can have at this point is is people who think like us and believe like us or at least are close like they don't have to be perfect they just have to share our values mm-hmm. um, in, in with broad strokes and we need to have people like that who have power and influence who have money well, well why the fuck um, are you in LA Matt I want people like this over my bed backyard helping me build a wall against the horrids that's that's my biggest concern right now i got two weeks of being terrified of my neighbors to fucking contend with <laughs> well it's funny i've been i my plan here with us here has been all along has been kind of like yeah hey, we'll probably be here for five to seven years something like that kind of because there's there's aspects of living in la that i enjoy we've got some friends here we've got um you know soccer that we like watching and um it's beautiful being able to just go down to the beach and Weather here is phenomenal. There's lots of things that are really, really nice about living here. So it's kind of like I want to take five, seven years to just kind of experience that, get my fill of it before I'm ready to move on. And then mm-hmm. my my dream, my plan is to get us up into the up into the woods somewhere, somewhere out. I want to have a ranch. I want some chickens. I want some cows. I want to be able to grow my own food. I want to be able to hunt. I just want to get out out from away from the city. And this whole thing has totally fast tracked that. I'm like, <laughs> <Right>. earliest opportunity. <laughs> that is absolutely my feeling so much because, you know, I would, we always talked about it as a couple. I'm not against it. Like I, I grew up in, I grew up in the country. I like right. that. And but, he's like, I just got to the city. I want to experience it. And now I'm just like, no, we got to go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, she's grown up in the city her whole life. And like, well, I'm yeah, yeah. just ecstatic to be around culture for a change. Yeah. Like I, I grew up in the fucking woods. Like I'm, I'm, I, I got to find which back roads I can manage to use to get back into New York state. Cause I'm pretty sure they're on lockdown by now. But yeah, like, it's, it's difficult. Cause I think even, I guess even if nothing else, the industries that I have been a part of, they're fucking Oh, maybe they'll come back. I don't know. You know, are bars and all that shit going to be open the way that they used to be? I see a lot of them going under when this all hits the van. I do too. I, I, I don't, like I said, for me, I see two months seems like I got, if, if it's only two months, that's it. I'd be ecstatic about that. I think, oh, that's a huge win. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter what we come out to after at that point. I, I see that as being very, very optimistic because. Yeah. Here's an optimistic thing to think about. The fact that it's been it's been endlessly exasperating to me that people have been so have been so skeptical of this whole thing that they've been like, "Yeah, it's overblown hysteria. Screw you. I'm going to go out to my spring break and you know, we're going to go to the bar and drink and have parties and everything." What it's it's exasperating to me because I see the virus as a legitimate threat, but at the same time, it's a bit of a consolation because all of these people, it's showing what people think of those in power who are trying to control them. They're like, "Screw you." You've, you've misled me so many times, I'm not going to believe you. Now, maybe that's a bad thing because now they're going to get confirmation that they should have listened. And so maybe it will re- reignite their trust and, and belief in the, in the system and the powers that be. But the fact that people have been so skeptical of it is, is a little refreshing to me. Well, the big thing is I, I wish they would take it as an uh, issue with authority, but I see them taking it as an issue with the other team's authority. Like it's just entrenching that same fucking two-party bullshit, like that team mentality. God, why do people yeah. like teams so much? I guess for me, like, it's frustrating because I've never had that. Whatever makes people want to be good, normal, participating society people, I've never fucking had that. <laughs> I just kind of <laughs> want to be able to do my own thing and try and keep to myself. Well, no, I I, I will um, call 
bullshit on that because I think I've, I'm seeing people, you know, you're in your neighborhood, you have to be there. And I, I see people sort of communicating, okay, over the internet with their neighbors a lot more than I had before. And so I feel like there is, um, you know, there is a little bit of a community building that's happening that isn't related to that left, right, blue, red thing. And I, I, I take that as a good thing. I'm, I'm hoping we could see more of that. I, yeah, I do think that there's going to be a, a, um, more of a localist response to this where people people are going to kind of get back in touch with their own tribes with um like Nick you say you say that um you don't understand the whole team thing team you know team red blue um and you're just you just kind of want to be left alone and kind of do your own thing i would ask you does that mean that you would prefer to be around people who believe the same way you do i don't know i don't care up until like i have to <laughs> Yes, that's the yeah, big but I mean, thing. But I mean, in general, you want to be around other people that feel the same way. They just want to be left alone. Oh, no, and absolutely. And I think maybe that's a thing. Like, those other people choose to participate in society more than I do, so it becomes more apparent quicker. Because absolutely, I'd rather be around people that believe like me. I would like to have a tribe of people. But in the same vein, like, I guess my necess- my need for tribe is perhaps smaller than theirs is. And maybe that's mm-hmm. it. Tribe is not something that comes up all the time in my life. Like, I really just worry about my family. And then so occa- tr- occasionally I'll have to think outside of that paradigm. So your tribe would be the people who don't want a tribe. Yeah, basically. <laughs> kind of. So you're still part of a tribe. Right. Well, no, that's why that's <laughs> why we have peace breaks. Yeah, I understand from a psychological level. I get that part yeah, of it. Yeah. I guess it's for me like the idea of a mass tribe. Like it is, I, I see like tribes being useful to a certain point. What's that? What's the 127 people? I can't remember what the, that particular. Oh, yeah. That, that oh, was Dunbar's something you number. brought up yeah. on our last. Uh... Yeah, Dunbar's number. Basically, you got up until that point where it's useful. And then after that, right. it loses all fucking meaning because you're trying to force thing people to believe shit that they don't believe <laughs> to make yeah, it work. Yep. Make it work. Yeah. It's, I've, I've said before that the the, the urge, I, it, this occurred to me, I was like anti-tribalism until this thought occurred to me that um, that tribalism is is inevitable. It's another kind of constituent part of the human human psyche because even the urge to get rid of tribalism is itself a tribal urge. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I don't know that it's necessarily inevitable. And this is the one thing where I always come back to with a lot of people uh, is that we don't know what's inevitable. We don't know what the innate humanness of us is because all of us are born into some culture. And we don't know what happens when you strip away culture and you just get rid of it entirely. There's there's no way to run that experiment. Because as long as you have people around you, you're going to, if not have a culture, develop a culture. So it's like the thing that it always comes back to, like the old libertarian um, question of like ages of consent and shit like that. It's like, well, people say, well, if you, you take advantage of a child, then it's because, you know, it's, it's innately damaging to the child. Maybe the fact of the matter is, is it's damaging to a child because you have so much fucking baggage that you've traded them, trained them to have that inevitably they're going to wear baggage that they know because you've infused that into them. We have no idea how that works without that. Now, I think it's disgusting because I'm fucking brought up in a culture that thinks it's disgusting and I, you, you can't undo that in me the same as you can't do undo anyone else. So there is a very big difference between a culture that thinks it's okay to marry 13-year-old girls versus the culture that I came up in. I think it's gross, but then again, that's my fucking culture. And, and I think that that's why you're always going, like, that's why I've always liked the idea of panarchism, where you're going to have multiple different types of governing bodies kind of handling every different type of people, and they will choose to get along or not get along, hopefully choose not to associate with people they don't need to. Yeah, I don't. It, 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 it's to the to the marrying thirteen year old girls thing too. Also, I uh, agree that it's disgusting. But also, are are all thirteen year old girls in all time frames all the same? You know, the <laughs> development of puberty. Exactly. Yeah, it's this is when the 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 whatever that goober was who was running for for senate who is a who's getting accused of being a pedophile on um, mm-hmm. Roy Moore was that his name? Yeah, there's a if you go listen to the propaganda report because she's got some feelings on that as well. Okay, yeah, because to, to him, like some of the stories that that it was being told about him i like i i think that guy's a, a goofball and i obviously would be not interested in supporting him for whatever it's worth whatever disclaimer i need to make but the stories that they were telling about him i was kind of like it seems like he was just a product of a different era and it was very normal then and so now we're just taking some arbitrary i mean maybe he was a creep back then too i don't know well at 14 14- in the 1700s, dudes were fucking leading families like in our country. Yeah, exactly. We, we've extended adolescence way fucking 
beyond when it used to be. Like that's that's there used to not even there used to not even be a thing called adolescence. Yeah. You just went from a child to an adult. Yeah. So the fact of the matter is, like, there is a, an age at which there is physical maturity, and our fucking lizard brains aren't always the best at dealing with that. You know, we have culture yeah. to kind of keep things boxed in. And like I said, I'm brought up in a culture, so I feel the same way as everybody else does about this shit. But especially amongst ANCAPs when they start calling for like fucking murder of pedophiles and shit. And I'm like, I, I'm not okay with that guys. Like me neither. Like protect the people that we want to protect as best we can. And if we have to shun those fucking people, that's by all means, but I'm not willing to fucking kill people over something like that. Yeah. Agreed. Certainly not. Certainly not. Like the people are like, well, even if you just think it like you deserve now, to die. If they, if they, if they prey on my children, then yeah, we're going to have a different conversation. But no, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> but I don't think there's anything. I, I, there, that's a, uh, that's a crime of passion. Like, I don't know what you could do about that. Like you, even you, you know, <laughs> that you're forced into a position on that. This is part of, this is my major issue with the criminal justice system as it is, is that, is that there is no, um, that, that it's by, it's defaulted that there's a third party that has to manage this stuff and that people don't actually, like, I think that there's something that's very psychologically necessary for someone to be able to respond personally to a harm that was done to them. When you take yeah. that right away from them. So if, if I, if my, if my wife was murdered and I am powerless to do something about it, I just have to wait for the state to go and try and manage it and they figure it all out. And I'm just a spectator. That's, there's no sense of justice there. And then what, the guy gets locked in a cage and so now my tax dollars have to support him for the rest of his life? Yeah. There's no justice here. Now, I'm not necessarily endorsing revenge, well, but... to the other side of the coin, what about those people that have to watch someone be murdered for something that they don't they don't want them or they don't feel like that price is worth it? And now it's on their yeah. conscience that someone... So like you say, there was that woman who... Uh, that that lady cop killed her you know, children or killed, killed her son and then like the brothers up there and said, you know, I, I forgive you, you know, and that whole thing. Say that woman was put for the death penalty as opposed to some time behind bars. And he has to deal with the fact that, well, he's forgiven her. Society is going to murder that woman for something he, he feels like whatever justice she needs could be better paid elseways. Yeah, that can't be psychologically healthy. Yeah, but we do that to both sides of the coin now. Anything you need to get in here, Liz? I, I feel like I've, I've covered most of the topics of the matter I've been had on my mind. Uh, no, I mean, I... I... Kind of, I enjoyed the conversation. I chimed in when I when I had something to say. You guys, uh, you guys always go to the the interesting places, and I'm I'm cool with that <laughs> conversation happening. So. Anytime you feel you want to get the into the weird weeds, Matt, know you got a spot here, man. Well, we love we love having you on. It's always an like I said, an entertaining conversation, and I don't get to get too deep into the philosophy all the time. So well, thanks, guys. I appreciate. it. I always enjoy these conversations too. <laughs> that out of the way am i a crazy person well i think that exploring all of the ideas has its merit because um you know there there's there's that community you're building by expressing those ideas there's that catharsis that you get from you know actually saying those things out loud and yeah they might not be the most useful things once once they're out there but you know i think we all are processing this in uh in whatever way we we need to process that i think you know, at least at making those attempts is worthwhile. I hear you. I was I was listening to a whole uh, a podcast just talking about kind of 
that feeling of grief. Well, they described it as grief, but like kind of the, just that feeling where, you know, you miss like knowing what life was, knowing what you were going to do tomorrow and being able to kind of get a handle on things. There's not a lot of handles right now. So, um, you know, I think it's okay to, to deal with for that. yourself, baby. I got handles. <laughs> but um, chick, hey, yeah. I'll be here all week, folks. Eat the chowder. But no, I don't. I don't think anybody should be given up yet. And uh, you know, I I hope that that you found the uplifting parts of that that conversation uplifting. And you know, all the ideas are worth putting out there. I think. Right on. We uh we forgot at the beginning of the episode to say, hey, everybody, go stop over to peacefreaks.com. Spell it whichever way you like. Mm-hmm. And uh, check out the show notes. Check out uh, all the other stuff that we have on there. If you had a few shekels, I'm not going to say don't do them because I lose. I lost most of my income personally. Thankfully, Liz is still working and I've got a little bit of uh, a job still. But I don't know how long that's going to last because they're talking about this uh, digital currency. And since I, my day job deals in cash, that could be a problem for me. Liz is looking at me like she had not considered that yet. So. Oh, no, I'd absolutely considered that. We talked about it because... That's a thing. I mean, that's been on your mind. I know, but you weren't responding to me, so I'm assuming that you were either. No, I just again, you know, these are things we don't we don't know what's going to happen, and I can't. Are you getting wistful or something over there? I don't really have a, you know, I can't promise you it's going to be okay, but um, I'm pretty sure we're going to figure something out. That's usually how this works. I mean, I think on the whole, that's usually how humanity works. You know, I was listening to a podcast talking about the Black Death. That whole plaguey thing that happened with all the the 50% survival rate thingy back in the day before the modern medicine. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people still exist. Sucked, but figured it out. So, well, I guess that's all we can do. You know, I I hope things don't get too weird too fast. I agree. That'd be cool. Uh, it'd be cool honestly if we could like reintegrate into like somewhat of a better society on no i want to i that's the thing i don't want to reintegrate shit (laughs) i I, I want to i want to try and get all of our shit fixed so that we can just run away well no and i i I get that and i think you know there's some merit in that i think there's been a lot of you know people who are you know all those people who are kind of like oh man that uh that homestead i was thinking about starting this we should we should do that like now did, like, did patrick mcfarlane get a hold of you no we were talking about uh he's all all amped up to start gardening now oh yeah for sure because again like liz has done the full-on like homestead front right now like she's just been well, watching I've, I've video been, like, after video of like how do you survive world war it. one and the depression key into it forever and now i'm just like nope nope i'm done i'm done pussyfooting around we gotta get this going get it done right now but yeah no i mean i, I see a lot of victory garden posts out there and i, and I think you know, at the very least, it's it's something constructive that people can do that that gives them a little bit of a sense of control. I and don't see a lot of them because generally they're like followed by plant a flag, in which I immediately delete that person because they offer nothing to society. Okay, well, all I'm saying is if that's the the most you could do to take personal responsibility for yourself, grow your grow yourself some food. I think that's that's something that's worthwhile. Grow yourself some worms. Um. Yeah, I am. Um, and, you know, if you can take it a few steps farther and actually, you know, be able to support your whole family or your family and your neighbor, like, geez, oh, I just we, we could almost. I just thought of another fun thing that happened this week. What's that? I about ripped my hair out doing an episode of Free Market Screen Earth with Ben. Oh, yeah, I heard about that. Uh, we, we did uh, we did an episode on Elizabeth Warren's Blue New Deal. Yeah. Because, you know, Green New Deal isn't going to be disruptive enough to society she needed a blue one too i mean you know it hurt my head to go over the whole thing <laughs> I, I was so angry like yeah. by the end of it i'm just tired of even reading it there's so much there she had like thirty thousand plans and they were yeah. all evil just straight up evil i see well there you go you can you can learn about the evil plans by uh, listening to go check out free market screen earth free market screen earth that's, that's It'll be a, a good fun one, one. You guys going to talk about that documentary? Because I would love to hear that episode. Too. Yeah, we're we're planning on it next week. I I bring bring up in this week's episode. Ben didn't want to watch it yet, he, despite the fact that I've like, been telling him for a week. It's one of the most amazing documentaries I've ever watched. Need to grow. The need to grow. Um, Something yeah, like go, that. Go out, go out and check it out, folks. It's uh, it's online. It's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. So I guess we'll call that an episode for today, folks. So thanks for coming out. 
Yep. Thanks for thanks for being cool and uh, you know, be good. Go out uh go give us some rates and reviews and stuff. I actually as part of getting prepped for the new This Week in Liber Pods, I actually stumbled across our podcast on the uh the what Apple podcast it? on the Apple podcasts yeah. and read some of the reviews we do have. They're fun. I'd like more of those. I, I will actually probably start reading them on the show if if I get more. It's actually actually kind of keeping hope alive there. So we appreciate it, folks. It makes me feel much better. I'll say that much. So all right, take it easy, folks. Yeah, and uh, you can you can still make it magical. Peace. This podcast is a proud creation of the Mad Audio Lab. For more information, check out madaudiolab.com. Peace Freaks is part of the Liberty Hippie Podcast Network. If you like what we do, be sure to check out Homesteads and Homeschools, Free Markets Green Earth, Cannabis Heals Me, and This Week in Liberpods. We're living proof that libertarian doesn't mean washed up Republican.